Statistics, binomial distribution, looking at the standard deviation of sample means, otherwise known as standard error. Get ready and some coffee because it's time to get realistic with statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're current. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1936 binomial distribution standard deviation of sample means or standard error tab, looking at a situation similar to recent presentations, except this time we have a binomial distribution by meaning two which we will return to shortly however similarities to recent presentations include the idea that we want to find information about a large population we can't test every item within the large population because there's just too many items therefore strategy we take a sample we test the sample hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the larger population. The two strategies we might use, one hypothesis testing, often lending itself to situations where we think we know what that middle point is and we're trying to test if that is true or if we should reject that original assumption. Two confidence intervals used in situations or lends itself to situations where we don't know what the middle point is that's what we're basically trying to find with some degree of confidence so now we have a binomial type of situation which you'll recall means two so in our prior examples we might have been measuring things such as we had dice so when you roll the dice every roll you had one through six that could be chosen or we have heights average heights where if you're taking a sample of heights, you might get results that would be like 6-2, 6-4, 5-3, 5-2, and so on and so forth. Or weights, where you would have the similar average weights of people getting multiple uh, results. Here, however, we have a binomial situation where there's only two possible results. We're going to test, for example, this time, a coin flip where each individual coin flip can only be either heads or tails. There can be no other options. There's many other examples of binomial situations, such as, for example, an election between two people could be a binomial. It's either one person or the other, or you can ask the question, are you voting for this person or not voting for this person? Yes or no situation. Many surveys can be structured in a binomial situation. Did you like the service or did you not like the service? I don't want to bug my clients with, a scale of one to a hundred or something like that, just a yes or no on uh, the survey. So there's only two possible results. Now, of course, if you only have two possible results and we graph two possible the results in terms of was it heads or was it tails, did you like it or did you not like it? We're gonna end up with a situation where we don't have a bell curve. There's only two bars if I was to make a histogram of did you like it or did you not like it? Was it heads or was it tails? which means we can't really use that bell-shaped curve on the actual binomial data of the population because it's binomial, it's not bell-shaped. But according to the central limit theorem, as we've thought about before, if we imagine that we took uh, all possible uh, combinations of samples of whatever sample size we are looking at, and we took the mean of all those samples, that once again should tend towards a bell-shaped curve so the same kind of concept applies however the formula for the standard deviation of those means of all the samples uh, is a little bit different so just a quick recap the idea being here we want if we want to use that bell curve we want to have the middle point which is the mean we want the standard deviation which is the spread when we think about the mean the mean of the actual population uh, you have that mean, 
we also have the mean of the sample, and then we can imagine the mean of all possible combinations of, of sample size within the, the, the population. All three of those will tend towards the same mean, right? It's gonna tend towards that same middle point. It's the standard deviation that's funny. The standard deviation of the population measures spread, but might not give us what we want because that spread will not be in the form of a bell-shaped curve or possibly won't be, certainly not in a binomial situation. We could get the standard deviation of basically one sample, but again, uh, that might not be what we're looking for in terms of measuring a bell-shaped curve. We then could imagine that we took every combination of sample uh, within whatever the size of the population and took the mean of all of the samples and that's the thing that could tend towards a bell shape type of curve. Now we've tested that out in prior presentations, but we wouldn't actually do that uh, typically. Uh, instead, we use this formula. So this formula is based on that concept. If it was normal standard deviation, not binomial, standard deviation of X bar would be the standard deviation of the population if known, if not standard deviation of one sample divided by the square root of n, that being the sample size. This second bit uh, we talked about before oftentimes could be dropped off if we have a large population. This time, however, because it's binomial, it looks a little bit different. So we still have this bit that we can usually drop off, but now we have uh, the p times one minus p. And we'll get into an idea of more of what that is in a second but then that's gonna be divided by N, which is the number of the sample, and we'll take that whole thing square root. But the concept is the same concept. Why do we use this formula? We use it because we're trying to get to that point where we can have a bell-shaped curve uh, using the central limit theorem. Same idea, but the formula is a little bit different because we have a binomial situation as opposed to a non-binomial situation. All right, given that binomial situation, We've got our heads and tails. Now, if we're gonna type this into Excel, oftentimes in these binomial situations, it's useful to apply one a heads or a tails uh, to a one or a zero as your results. So that if you plot this on a histogram, you can count the ones or zeros, and it's gonna give you a total count of the ones or zeros, and then you can take a percent of the total, right? So these are gonna add up to 13 plus 17, which is gonna be 30. So if I took 13 over 30, you have 43%, right? So you can, you can think about uh, the percentages, which is often how we're gonna think of it in a binomial situation, which is basically the average, right? That's basically the average because there's only two outcomes right there. So we'll see that more shortly. So if we think about the null hypothesis, if we think about this in terms of hypothesis testing and we're thinking about coin flips, remember that in theory, the population of coin flips would be like infinite coin flips, right? That's kind of like the idea you can think of as the, the ultimate population, or if not infinite, a very large number of coin flips. And we're taking, of course, a finite number of coin flips to represent what we think is going to happen in ultimate number of coin flips. Now, obviously, if the coin was an even coin, we would hypothesize that the percent T tails would be 50%. That would be, that would be basically our hypothesis. And we want to then run the test to see if we can accept or reject the hypothesis. So we could write that this way. Uh, percent test is not equal to uh, 50%. Wait a second here. It's going to be the null hypothesis is that it is equal to 50%. And then, and then the, to reject it would be that it's not equal to 50% is going to be the general idea. All right. So you could write that like this. So H sub O, that's going to stand for the null of mu, which is the mean, the middle point, the average is going to be 50%. And H sub A for the alternative, meaning... If, if that's not true, that we would reject it would mean it's not equal to, which we show in Excel with these with the less than and then greater than instead of like an equal sign with a, with a cross out through it, which is what you might normally do if it wasn't like computer software, right? This is how you do not equal to in Excel. All right. And so then we can say, all right, so what if we, if we then, well, before I get here, let's actually say, say we're going to run this now.
So I'm gonna I'm gonna run this test. Let's go down here and say okay, boom. So what we're gonna have here is our sample and then the count in the sample. Now when I run these tables, it's a little confusing because you could put the samples running vertically and the counts on, on the X and Y's could be different. But this time we're saying this is sample one and this is the number of counts, in this case flips in sample one. A zero you will recall represents heads and a one represents tails. So all we did is do a random number generation in Excel, random between zero and one. And we get the series of zeros and ones here. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And that's going to be that. And then we get a total uh, or the mean of all of those. And that's why it's useful to have zeros and ones, right? Because, because then you can take the average of all of those, which will give you, you would think, something tending towards 50%. In this case, it turned out to be 56% for our sample size of 30. So if I was to count them, if I was to count all of the ones, I would get 13 ones. Uh, we did that with a count if, count if it's a one. And then if I was to count all of the, uh, I'm sorry, all of the zeros, count all of the, and then count all of the ones, th we have 13 compared to 17. And then of course we can look at the percentages. So the percent of heads was 13, was 13 over 30, because there's a total of 30 for our sample. 43.33% and then we can say all right and then 17 over 30 comes out to 56.67 so we're looking at t at the mean of 56.67 that's basically uh the average right that's basically the average calculation because we have a binomial situation which you can represent with a histogram which would only have the two bars which is 13 and 17 or percentage wise 43 and 56. Now we're looking at the percent T outcome, which is the 56. So what's the average? It's going to be the 56. Now we could do this multiple times just to get an idea of the central limit theorem when we have a binomial situation. So now we have a binomial situation. The actual data is not bell shaped. There's only two bars to it. But if we imagine taking every combination uh, every combination of sample size 30 in this case will will approximate that by just running the sample a hundred times so now we're going to run the same thing a hundred times something you probably wouldn't do in practice but gives us the conceptual idea that if we took the mean of all of those now we're taking the mean of each of these 30 flip samples 130 flip samples then this is the mean of each of them, which again, if it was a fair coin, you would expect this to kind of be around 50%. So now we can take this column of numbers, and that is something that should tend towards a bell-shaped curve. So if we were to graph that, you can see it starts to tend towards a bell-shaped curve because now we're, we're applying the concept in essence of the central limit theorem, and therefore we can start to use the actual smooth curve of the bell shape to help us figure this out. So then the mean of the means, which is the average of all of these numbers then, is going to give us the 49.23. Uh, now remember that if we were doing one test, we have the actual mean of the population, which we're assuming is like 50%, the population basically being an infinite number of coin flips, the mean of any one sample sample count of 30 should also tend towards that middle point around 50 percent you would think and the mean of all of these means of all of the samples also should be tending towards something around 50 percent and this one you would expect be closer to around 50 percent so all of the means are there but with the standard standard deviation you will recall that's where the, the issue comes in because we have the standard deviation of the original data, which is not the thing that is bell-shaped. Then we have the standard deviation of the sample, which is not the thing that's going to be bell-shaped. And then you got the standard deviation of all of the means of, of all of the combinations, which we have calculated here by taking the standard deviation of the sample, but which we will then approximate Instead of doing this method, if we just had one sample, what would we do? We would apply the formula, 
which would be this formula instead of this formula because we're talking about a binomial situation, one which only has, of course, the two possible results. So then this is the, the standard deviation of the first sample. So this one's giving us the standard deviation of uh, this, this first column here. That's not usually what we're looking for to get the bell-shaped curve, but just to get you an idea, standard deviation of the population, standard deviation of a sample, which can approximate the standard deviation of the population, giving us a measure of spread, but not one we're looking for because we can't construct a bell-shaped curve on it. The standard deviation of all of the means, that's the one that's going towards what we want which in practice we wouldn't be able to do this way because we might not be doing a hundred different tests, but rather we would basically be, be approximating that with a formula. So then we're gonna go standard deviation uh, uh, size. So then we'll say, now this is helping, this is gonna be what we're gonna use to graph. So we'll get back to that in a second. Here's our Z test. Now the Z test should be around zero if everything came out perfectly. In other words, this is measuring in terms of standard deviations. What we got when we looked at the average of all of the means is something close to the hypothesis of 50%, but not exact. So we have, of course, 0.4923 minus 0.5 or 50%. There's our difference. If we divide that by the standard deviation, we're looking at this standard deviation because that's the one that's going to be approximating the bell curve divided by 0.0957. We've, we get this for the Z test. So it's close. It's fairly close to zero. We would expect it basically uh, to be zero if it was exact. We've got the p-bar or standard deviation. Now we're going to be calculating this with the formula. So if we calculated this with the formula, I won't punch it into the calculator because it's a little bit messy, but the idea would basically be we have p times 1 minus p over n, the square root of all of that. That is approximating this number, which we calculated by doing 100 samples of sample size 30, which is the concept of us approximating all possible combinations of samples uh, of sample size 30 within the population. That would be the idea. And now what we've derived this formula from that, from that concept. And so instead of uh, doing this in practice, we might only have one sample. We then are going to apply the formula to get that number. So the p-bar standard error calculation, which you can think of as in essence, standard deviation of all of the means of all the combinations uh, rather than the standard deviation of the population or the standard deviation of one sample which would tend towards the population this is the one that's going to tend towards the bell curve and you can see that it's pretty close to what we got up here the 0 0.0957 when we took the standard deviation of this column versus here 0 0.0913 when we used this formula in order to calculate it remembering we could call this the the uh, sigma of p bar uh which is sa similar concept as the standard deviation of the x bar when we had a non-binomial situation which was just the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n so when we look at these two forms in it p what is p that's basically going to be the the mean here which is the 49.23 and then what is going to be the second bit, 1 minus P? Well, that's simply going to be 1 minus the 49.23. So, so notice because it's a binomial situation, we have, we have P, which is going to be basically the mean, and then 1 minus P representing the other part, right? 100% minus uh, P, it would be the idea. All right, so that's going to be this one. Here's, here's us doing the calculation in Excel with the square root uh, calculation and now if we were to graph this now we've done it we've done this we've proved that it's going to tend towards a bell shape because of the central limit theorem so now let's go ahead and use the actual curve to graph a nice curve so that we can get a visualization of it to do that we're going to go four standard deviations above and below because we're trying to get a uh, a width large enough for us to graph the entire curve, right? So if we have four standard deviations, this is this is the standard deviation. This is the middle point is 0 0.49, point 
um, uh, two, three, and then we're going to say four standard deviations is going to be here's the standard deviation point 0957 times four, and then we could take that and say plus point four uh, nine two three, and that would be the upper bit, and then we could subtract, and that would be the lower bit. So that's going to be our idea. So if we graph this out, then our data is going to be over here. I'm putting it in terms of decimals instead of percents, but it's going 0 0.1, 0 0.11, and then it's going up to infinity. Now in Excel, we put it in here in such a way that this graph keeps on shuffling because of the random numbers that we let to calculate uh, randomly every time we click on something. So that's why we widened, out, widened it out a little bit more, but it's pretty close to this range. And then the P of X is going to be our norm dot dist calculation where we have X, the mean, 50% uh, standard deviation is going to be this number. And then it's not going to be cumulative, therefore zero. Now notice if I was to, to make that and copy it down and I was to select all of this, it doesn't come out to like 100%, which is something that you'd kind of like to see. I kind of like it to come out to 100%. This basically always happens. I won't get into the details of it as to why right here, but that's always basically going to happen when you have a binomial situation. If I was to sum up this column, it doesn't add up to 100. If I take this whole thing and divide it by 100, then you're going to get a sum here that will typically add up to 100%, right? So uh, you, could try, you could play with that uh, in Excel. We do it in Excel if you want to check that out. Then you got the Z-score. So the Z-score uh, is simply going to be X minus the mean uh, divided by the standard deviation so we're saying we have in this case 0.1 minus 0.5 divided by the standard deviation which is going to be this one is the one we want divided by 0.095 standard error and that's going to be the 4.1 makes sense because we we had our range go about four standard deviations up and below so the z is should be at zero at the middle point of our curve and then go up to around four on the high and the low. And then here we have, oh, what did I do? Okay, paso. Here we have two standard deviations. So now I put a formula in here with a logic test saying, hey, look, if this, I need an and, because there's two conditions, if this number is greater than negative two and it's less than positive two, then give me this number. If not, give me, uh, quotes blank we do this in excel if you want to do that and here's so it just has the ones in between that's what was used to graph this out so now we have this the middle point then being in essence the two standard deviations away in orange so here's our typical bell curve and what we're really looking for is usually kind of like the the x-axis because we're we're we know how much is under the curve we can basically think of the curve as having a hundred percent how much of it is under the curve around 95 percent if it's a normal bell curve is between two standard deviations away which is what we calculated here and the blue you would expect then around the five percent total in the two blue halves uh 2.5 percent on each side is the general idea we have two bars down below one the bottom one ma measuring in standard deviations the middle point then being in essence at zero going up to four standard deviations on each side, the blue starting at around two standard deviations, right? And then we can also measure it in terms of X's, which is of course these X's here, which are represented. And then we have the high and the low, which we can measure in two standard deviations within X's, right? So if it was two standard deviations would be around here, would be around 0.3 for the X's on the low side, boom, boom, right there. So there's, the general idea, remember this is being calculated from a hypothesis testing standpoint, meaning we made the curve not around the samples that we got, but around the original hypothesis, middle point being at 50%. Then we're taking our information to see if it's further enough away from that middle point for us to reject the original hypothesis. In this case, of course, it was not. Let's imagine a case where it's more likely that it could be rejected and see how that might go so let's say we do a same thing heads zero but now we're going to do an excel and say how can i make an uneven coin in excel well i could say let's do a random number generation between one and between zero and three 
And if I represent two and three B tails, then a random number generation should give me about two thirds because these two numbers over this should be on the tail. So it's gonna come up tails two thirds of the time instead of 50, 50. Our null hypothesis is still gonna be that mu the middle point equals 50%, even though in reality, now we can see that that's not gonna be correct, right? Because so, and then and then mu, the, the mu sub a or our alternative would be that it's not 50%. So then we can say, okay, if we have a count, let's let's look at our, our data. We can just do the same idea with the data where we had, here's our number of samples, a hundred of them. And here's our sample size. We have 30, uh, we have a hundred samples of sample size 30. If we count that, we have uh, the, the count of 30, we have the heads that we calculated. Now we had to, we had to count the heads uh, which were, were the ones that had zeros in them. So we counted everything with a zero. And then the tails, we counted everything that had a zero or a two, which means we basically added to, together two count if formulas is the general idea. And of course, we come out then to the heads are 12 over 30, which is around 40%. And then we have 18 over 30, which is around 60% uh, on the result. If I calculate that over here, we can say, okay, let's go to the right and we can see our calculations. Now it's a little bit trickier because I had to say, okay, I can't just, I can't just take the average of the ones and zeros uh, because now I have more than, I have more than those. So I have to say H, uh, H sub O is going to be, we, we counted all of the, all of the zeros over here. And then I did another one and we said, now we want to count. I added two count formulas, count all of these if uh, it's a one and then plus count them if there's a two. So now we've counted those out. So then the total count, if I add those two up, adds up to 30. And then, and so now I can, now I can say, okay, so now I have the 12 and the 18 add up to 30 and I can do my average now which would be just uh, 12, uh, we're looking at, in this case, we're looking at this side, the tails, 18 over 30. So 60%, this one we're looking at 15 over 30, 50%, uh, and then so on and so forth. We're looking at the tail side, 22. Ooh, what did I do there, que paso? Uh, 22 over 30 right and so on and so forth so if you want to get the details in excel to get this a little bit more tricky just to get the numbers in here but we're focused not so much on excel calculations here but the general concept uh so we have x bar for the means so if we then took the mean of all of this information we come out to 6547 which is not what we would expect from the hypothesis which was around 50 percent was our hypothesis the standard deviation of all of these which again could be approximated with the formula, but we did a bunch of samples. So that's the standard deviation. The P bar or standard error, meaning we're similar uh, to the calculation here, but we did this with the formula now, with the formula to calculate it. And then we have our Z test. Now again, the Z test you would imagine to be at zero if our hypothesis was correct. But of course we're way off here because we have 0.6547 minus the middle point that we expected, which was 50%. There's our difference divided by, let's take this one, divided by the standard deviation or standard error, 0.0913, gives us about 1.69 or so. So it's not what we would expect. It's, it's, it's still within like two standard deviations, right? But it's pretty far away from that middle point. So then the question comes up, of course, how far away does it have to be for us to reject the, the null hypothesis, which we'll get into more later. But the general idea is if I was to graph this, notice I would still graph it in a similar way if we're doing hypothesis testing, the middle point being at that 50%. Then the results that we got were around here. Was it 67? That's why that green thing is there. 60, the results we got were about six, it was 65 in our case. It might've been a little different because I keep on shuffling it around. 
but it was yeah it's it's over here somewhere right it's not quite in the blue but the question is is that far enough away for us to reject the original null hypothesis right because you'd expect it you, you expect our results to be here we got results basically over here so we'll get into more detail about that in the future but that's the general idea noting the difference between the hypothesis testing and possibly confidence interval with hypothesis testing as with here where we think the coin is fair we would expect it to be in the middle and then with our results we say is that farther far enough away for us to reject our original assumption whereas with confidence intervals we often have a situation where we don't know what the middle point is we have no idea if this coin is fair we got it from a magic shop or something it could be any probability we don't know and then when we flip the coin then we're going to assume that is the middle point and then we could still use hypothesis testing by basically backing into the confidence interval basically assuming well what if this was the actual middle point of the coin would that would my results still be within the tail for us not to reject it and we can ask that question for many every point around it getting our confidence interval which would be like peak to peak this way but typically what we would like to do is get that middle point from our from our test and then see if we can use hopefully some kind of bell-shaped curve possibly a normal distribution or in some cases t distributions or something like that for us to get basically our range around it so we'll talk more about that in future presentations